On the show tonight, we have sound behaviourist Janet Marlowe with us. Imagine prescribing music instead of Prozac to your animals. Right after Janet, we've got the chat box and we have Cleo the Border Collie in there tonight. She wants to talk to mum about her running style. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back in just a moment. Welcome to the Animals Television Show everyone. I'm your host Romy Bueller and I have a fabulous show for you tonight. I have Janet Marlow with me. She's a sound behaviourist and founder of Pet Acoustics. She is an author, a speaker, a consultant to organisations and veterinary practices around the globe and tonight she'll be sharing with us her 25 years of research as a sound behaviourist and how the power of species specific music can calm the nervous system, releasing muscle tension and stress. Right after Janet, we'll be talking to Cleo, the hyperactive, vibrant, ball-obsessed Border Collie. For now, I would love to introduce you to Janet Marlowe. Welcome, Janet, and thank you for joining me. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with me today. I'm very interested in the work that you do, and you've been doing for quite some time, I believe, too. Can you perhaps just start by letting everyone know what is a sound behaviourist and how you got into that line of work, particularly with animals? Well, first of all, Rami, thank you very much for having me on this wonderful show. Thank and you. I'm always uh, excited to have the opportunity to share um, what sound behavior is and how I became uh, this uh, in, in this new field of uh, understanding animals through their hearing sensitivities because animals hear um, more than humans and so sound for them and their environment is extremely important and it leads to uh, their survival, but it also leads yes. to stress and there are many facets to that. So I thought I would start off by sharing my research as a sound behaviorist. Um, this is a chart that shows um, our human hearing in <laughs> gray. Yeah. From 20 to 20,000 Hertz. Hertz is just one cycle per second. Um, and the next uh, chart is horse hearing. So horses and, and uh, humans hear the most closely related of all mammals. And then we go to dogs and they hear twice as much as humans. And cats hear three times more than we do. Wow. Um, I'm just writing a, a second book in a series called What Cats Hear. I've done one on dogs, What Dogs Hear. And I'm just fascinated as I go through the um, the structure of the cat ear and um, and the sense the high sensitivity to high frequencies and low frequencies. Um, so because sound is invisible, we don't give it much attention. But yes. it truly really affects humans daily. Um, there are radio waves in the air. There's um, vibrations. There's uh, so many. 
uh, sonics that occur. And we know, obviously, when thunderstorms occur, how it affects us. But for an animal, for a dog and our beloved cats, it is terrifying because the essence of sound behavior is that when air pressure enters the inner ear and hits the membrane before the cochlea, this is for animals and for us, there's these little cilia, these mm -hmm. hips just before. And what happens is that, that when the sound goes above a comfortable level, that cilia bends. And that sends a nerve impulse to the brain saying, uh-oh, either danger or pain. So those experiences are going on for dogs and cats and horses all the time. Um, but we're not experiencing what they're experiencing because we don't hear, we gotta get my thing in the right place. We don't hear what they're experiencing and their world yeah this whole upper register um, of sound. And that's where we see, obviously, the, um, the outcome of that pressure in the ear and their um, fear to either do flight um, and or they're in our homes and that relates to stress. So I have two sides to this um, kind of problem solution that I've been working on for 25 years. Um, beforehand, I was, I was telling you previously that um, I was a recording artist and stage performer in classical and jazz, but the yeah. world, and understood that relationship of sound and music to an audience, which I loved doing, just creating that circle between myself, my instruments, and, and the audience. And one day, my cat, Osborne, um, one of my pets, because all my pets would come to my side when I would practice and I would see how they would be completely soothed. I mean, if I was playing one end of the house, they would all come and yeah, there and they would be profoundly relaxed. I mean, it was like a different muscle uh, experience than just resting. Yes. And, um, he was injured in, the, in our woods. I live in the country. And I rushed him to the vet and for five days I went to sing to him because I knew how much he loved to be sung to. Yeah. Unfortunately passed. That was in 1994. For three years I did research on, I was fascinated, you know, what can I do to help other people's pets uh, appreciate and have this state of relaxation? So I did three years of research getting um, papers from universities where they study comparative hearing of animals. And because I'm a recording artist and I understand frequencies and decibels, decibel meaning volume and frequencies meaning that chart that I showed you. Yes, yeah. How high um, animals are sensitive to sound. Um, and I said, now wait a second, humans like big spectrum of sounds because it moves them. But for an animal that that is hyper sensitive to sound, um, what if I modify music that I compose according to the instruments that are sustaining and soothing that I've learned through the years um, and modify the music to be in the center of the hearing level that avoids that cutoff point of frequencies and decibels that put an animal into hypervigilance where they they have to tighten mm. muscles because they have to get ready for yeah. behavioral um response yeah well i did and i i spent a lot of time uh taking my music to veterinarians and friends and barns and anywhere and anybody i could experiment with and i got tremendous response people would say that my dog is relaxed my cat is less stressed my horse is falling asleep in the barn um Anyway, I proceeded, I, I am a scientist and I proceeded to do a lot of um, clinical studies. Um, I'm very excited to say after 25 years, and I have helped many, many thousands of pets worldwide, um, a biometric study that I just completed is getting published in the International Animal Health Journal, which is in the UK, but it'll be- Fantastic. Global. Um, 
<clears throat> to share the uh, biometric results, meaning the pulse rate, the heart rate, um, and the activity level of cats. And we did the study in uh, uh, Southern Australia. Um, I read that, yes. I thought that was interesting that you came down to my part of the world. Yes, yes, with Melissa Newman, who is, and right. uh, Judith Jordan, who are just wonderful, dedicated uh, cat people and that helped me tremendously. Um, but they, we, we learned that the, um, because with cats, you can't really observe their um, physical response because they're stoic. They don't want yes. to share with that. And they are very subtle beings. Um, with dogs, it's a little easier to see. But I wanted to do this with cats. And it, the uh, by having the music uh, that I composed for cats on and not having the music on, it showed comparatively that with music that the, um, the biological state of the cat was in a better state of health. So it's wow. wonderful to to be able to prove that and show that. So um, so that's really kind of the general um, sequence and timeline of where I went from my music life to my beautiful cat Osborne to the scientific proving of the power of species specific music of which I invented in 1997. Wow, it's it's just uh, it's fantastic. You know, there are so many in my work. I see so many animals with anxiety: horses, cats, dogs. Um, particularly, uh, tend to be the the main animals that I communicate with. And <clears throat> what I find, actually, I had a a little dog who passed. Unfortunately, he was a beautiful little mini Schnauzer, and I was having a conversation with him. He was at the vet. He was very very sick, mm -hmm. and he said to tell his mum that he liked the music that was playing, particularly the strings. And it was really interesting. So um, is there a particular a key or a tone or an instrument that you find, well, a cat, dog, horse or, or a bird, you know, do they all resonate with the same thing or? That was such an interesting uh, statement that you made um, because, uh, there are there have been studies uh, um, on what instruments work best, uh, and the ones that work best are sustaining instruments. So I never put percussion, I never put human mm. in the music. Um, no brass instruments. It's all strings, guitars, harps, flutes. Um, yes. And and, uh, and the the music um, because what species specific is is that not only do I contour it to the hearing level of each animal, but I also, uh, for example, um, uh, dogs here have a less um, higher frequency capacity. So I bring the music down into a median between that. Cats can hear, they have a tremendous hearing uh, high frequency. So I put the music in slightly higher register. But do the similarity between dogs and cats is that they prefer long sustained phrases. I, the imagery that I always have is it's like putting your, 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 the dog goes into this canoe on this most gentle river and is just being soothed down without any fluctuation of volume. Um, uh, I modify every note uh, so that it is the, the environment is they will feel completely safe and connected to the environment. And by doing that, uh, in terms of hearing, they will release muscle tension, mm. release stress. Horses, yes. completely different. They love short melodies um, and they love rhythm. So I'm very strong in my two, four, three, four, and four, four rhythms when I write from, for horses. Here's a great story. I had a woman call me who is a horse owner whose uh, horse suffers from narcolepsy. Right. And he was hurting himself in the stall by all of a sudden falling asleep and hitting his body oh. wherever, wherever he was. She said, I've tried everything. I've tried everything. And I got your equine music and the horse just lays down and goes to sleep. And she thanked me, thanked me, thanked me. And I thanked her because I was so 
grateful to be able to help that horse go into a better state for health. And that, that is my goal um, with every animal that I help, um, to help them prolong their life, release stress. Uh, cats, as we know, um, any, any high levels of stress will lead to illness in, in a cat. Um, mm. And sometimes the solution is just by playing the music in different scenarios, uh, car travel, um, if they're left alone, um, introducing a new cat to another cat, introducing a cat adopted into a home with, with children and, and dogs. I mean, it's, they have tremendous um, capacities to adjust, but they need to adjust and maintain that state of well-being. That's why you can see on my, my poster here, music for behavioral balance. So, I love that. Yeah. yeah. So tell us a little bit about the the actual speakers that you've got there, your pet tunes. Yes. So um, with all this knowledge and science, um, I wanted to provide products. So I created the company Pet Acoustics. Um, and I wanted to provide products that were easy for the pet parent to use or the veterinarian. Um, and all they had to do was turn it on. Uh, and this is, it's all preloaded in a Bluetooth speaker and, um, the oh, great size, <laughs> very yeah. handy size. Yeah. Very handy size. It's portable. Um, we have many, uh, micro SD cards that can be interchangeable because humans need variety, but animals don't. They, as right. as they hear the same safety and, and, you know, calm environment, they will release into that and they will do that for 10 years, no problem. But we, mm. we need variety. Yeah. Um, uh, I also have music if a person has a dog and a cat in the same house. So I, I've thought through what is, what is the ideal environments um, and products to make things easy. I've also produced uh, for the sake of thunderstorms and fireworks, which is so huge, huge. Yeah worldwide um, is as a collar device um, that's preloaded with music uh, and it goes on the back of the neck of the dog. Um, we, it's in small, medium and large. And the music is um, modified. You can't make it loud to try to see if your dog jumps up to the ceiling. <laughs> yeah. But uh, would, people would try. Um, but um, it's very easy to use, and you and I wanted to do something that wasn't a material to wrap around a dog, but was just a collar device that a dog is normally expecting to have on. And um, this is called the Ultra Calmer Collar. Um, That's great. So, so they would feel the vibration as well as hear the sound through uh, that. They would, they would hear music um, that I modified, and it would take over their hearing. Yes. Um, and they would feel the uh, the calmness in their central nervous system, their spine, mm. and it would mask the outside sounds such as the thunder and the lightning. And uh, within a what few, a great thing. Yeah, I think we need a few of those for humans too, Janet. <laughs> <laughs> Just in general, maybe. Ask me, please. A necklace. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, so yeah, that's right. So it's it's. Uh, wonderful work. Um, I get a uh, lot of satisfaction, I, especially if a customer calls um, and I hear their story about their, their love for their animal and what they're trying to solve. I'm always willing to help. Um, and uh, it's, it's very exciting. Um, you know, I have uh, my a dear friend and distributor in Australia, Ron Pia, the pet calmer. Uh, who uh, helps me, um, has been growing the message and the uh, purpose of, of pet acoustics, and I'm uh, dearly grateful to him. Um, we are in, uh, in South America, in Chile, uh, we're in France and the UK, um, you know, we're Canada, Mexico. Um, it's, it's grown um, through the years uh, as the consciousness of taking care of animals in a more enhanced, better environment. Um, so that this, as the consciousness grows, the more people uh, uh, get onto the pet, pet acoustic system. Yes, and that's, 
that's that's what the animals television show is all about is to is to bring this awareness to everybody out there that um these things are available and and as i mentioned before you know in my work that anxiety and fear and you know the thunderstorm fireworks thing comes up all the time so mm -hmm. to have something that can help our animals is just an absolute um it's a magical thing so what are you working on now like where to from here where where do you go with this well um a couple of things um i'm working on um uh, focusing on another product which is called fit tunes um which is a bluetooth speaker that just clips onto the a handbag or the leash um for outdoor behavior modification because right. dogs um lunge uh yes. cars and bicycles um uh, they're aggressive or they're shy on the street uh, they they have noise phobias um uh and the idea of the um fit tunes is to build the confidence of the dog so that it can walk with other dogs um and yeah. not, really, not the, without aggression and it's very interesting to have um uh, the dogs uh, walk together that might have been, you know, aggressive with each other five minutes before and you just put the music on and it takes over their hearing and it modifies the circle. You know, I would love it if you would share with your audience um, a sample video of two German shepherds that I worked with, um, with the uh, pet tunes because it's, it's 36 seconds, but it really shows how quickly um, these uh, German shepherds that were in, um, they are trained to be uh, uh, assistants for the hearing impaired. Um, and we put, they put, we put the music on and I was showing the people that run the, the, um, the Fidelco Guide Dog Foundation. And within two minutes, these dogs were complete, in a completely different state. I would love it if you would share that. Let's do that. I think everyone should see this too. Do you have your uh, pet acoustics speakers in vets and rescue centres around the place? Are, are they well received there uh, hmm. at the moment too? Because I can imagine, you know, animals going into vet clinics, you know, that's not their favourite thing to do. Hmm. And, you know, pre-surgery, post-surgery, that type of thing for from a healing point of view and, and you know, stress release. Yes. Um I would say that uh, when uh, I have veterinarians use my music all over the world, um, uh, particularly in the United States, uh, because I know I started here, the, you know, I started the uh, distribution of it here. Um, they have them in every room. Uh, they have them in the lobby. Um, they have them in the exam rooms. You're absolutely right. They use them for pre-surgery, post-surgery healing. Uh, the the catteries, um, uh you know, the kennels, there, there is no situation that the music has not been used by uh, veterinarians. Um, I have some veterinarians that believe in it so much that they, they instead of uh, prescribing Prozac um, for an animal for calm, they will say, could you please try this music first? Oh. They actually prescribe the music. Yes, that's fantastic. A more holistic approach. Start there first and, and see what the benefits are first up it wasn't that way in the beginning 25 years ago i bet i can imagine you no know, uh, i i always say 25 years ago people would laugh when i'd say music for dogs and now if i'm at a gathering within before i can even finish talking about it they're on their phone ordering the product you know <laughs> yeah so we've, we've come a long way and it, it's uh <laughs> yes it's, it's good and I know, you know, in Australia, 61% of households have pets. 
you know, there's 29 million pets in Australia, and that doesn't account for the US or the UK or any anywhere across the globe. But the, you know, the statistics are probably similar. Mm -hmm. um, oh gosh, it's just such a fantastic um, product that you have out, and your research and your continued work um, mm -hmm. doing this. It's 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 been an absolute pleasure to have you on today, Janet. Where can people find you? I've got your website there. Is that the best place for people to find you? Absolutely. They can write to me. Um, I love hearing from, from pet lovers. And uh, if they have any behavioral questions, I would love to hear that. Um, the, the website, uh, petacoustics.com, uh, has a lot of explanations, has a lot of my, I do, a, uh, I share a lot of my um, advice uh, and uh, on my blog. Um, so, you know, I welcome all. I Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, as I said, it's been a pleasure to have you on and keep watching everybody. We'll be back very soon as we have Cleo in the chat box. Thank you, Janet. We'll be back soon. Learn how to talk to your animals. You ask them a question and you receive an answer to understand their why why their anxiety, why the strange behavior, why the performance problems. When you understand your animals, you can give them what they need. Sign up now for the show special. Receive 10% off the online beginner level animal communication course. The Animals Chat Box is the segment where I get to have a chat with some of our viewers' animals. Now, it's not a verbal conversation like I'd ordinarily have with someone. It's a conversation using the language of animals where we transfer images, words, and feelings from one to the other. I can smell on behalf of an animal, I can taste what they taste, hear what they hear, I can feel in their body what they feel. And you can gather a lot of information communicating this way from behavioral issues to emotional and mental health issues. I can taste their food and I can feel in their body where they're unwell or where they're injured. This is often referred to as animal communication. Right now, we have some animals waiting for us in the chat box. Let's go see who they are and what they've got to say to us today. I have Cleo and Cleo's mum Donna in the chat box tonight. Welcome ladies. Cleo, very busy, just looking at mum, adoring mum. <laughs> Donna, is Cleo a purebred border collie? We can see from the back of her, but maybe not so much from the front, her markings. She is a purebred border collie. She came from a farm down south in Western Australia, working mum and dad, so they worked on the farm. And mum had nine puppies. And she was actually sold when I rang to find out about the pups. She'd been sold already. And unfortunately, or fortunately for me, the um, surprise present for the um, wife uh, was not well received. So oh. Cleo, who was then known as Hannah, got brought back and the owners called me and said, hey, are you still interested? Because one, we've got a girl and she's been brought back. So she has just had her third birthday. So three years mm. old now. Right. Well, I have to say, while you were just talking about her being Hannah, she says, my name's Cleo, not Hannah. So obviously you were meant to get her and bring her into your mm. life. And she has something to say today because... I know you've got some questions and we're going to go through those. But as you know, because I mentioned to you, she's been waking me up, you know, every third or fourth night at one, two o'clock in the morning with something to say to you. And I don't actually know what that is because I just see her in my sleepy 2 a.m. vision and then that's about it. We don't kind of go very far. Now, I have a feeling that this is about running. And you have a question. Oh, she's bored now. She's gone. She's like, thanks very yeah. much. I'm a star. I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> she's looking for food. She's always looking for food. Give me yeah. more food. <laughs> yeah. Well, she's a working dog, hey? Um, yeah. One of the questions that you have was, does she like running on lead with you in the mornings? And I want to answer mm. that by saying this. Is the Pope a Catholic? <laughs> <laughs> That's not from her, but that's just kind of, that's like, ah, oh, it's really, is that a question? Um, I want to, I just want to check in with her and ask her why she was waking me up. Okay, this is about running. 
And this is about your running style. See, people out there, our animals know stuff. They talk about us in a way that we don't really expect. Do you have lower back problems, hip problems, something going on that you would be dropping in the hip or dragging your left foot or doing something with your running? Yeah, about uh, 18 months ago, I had a really bad stress fracture in my left femur, actually. And um, since having to, you know, heal it and, you know, I've been given the all clear to run again, but I'm a lot slower, which I actually think this is you're onto something because I go a lot slower than I used to because I just don't want to do this, you know, I don't want to inflame it again or have any, um, I don't want to stop running again. So I've just modified how I run a little bit and it is my left side and I probably just, my pace, she pulls me. So I'm running along and I'm being yanked along by her. And the reason I asked if she enjoys that is because I know she's much more used to running at a faster pace and she's off lead more often than she's on lead. So because we go to the park more often than not, um, the only time she's really on lead is to run with me. So I was curious as to whether she liked this new pace that it's funny you pick that up because that's that I know exactly what it is I'm slower and I think sometimes she gets really annoyed with me because she's not going as fast as as she's used to very yeah. interesting yeah well let, let's just follow that um path a little bit because she's got more to say about that um just just from your point of view um even resting a little bit longer would probably be worthwhile uh, for your own healing and recovery she mm. is a speed demon. She just, there's like two paces, fast and faster. There's just no, <laughs> we don't like stopping. And that's going to come into our next question about having a small backyard. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, she, she's a working dog. She just wants to run, run, run. And she's three years old, so she's just bursting with energy. With the running slower, there is there is a change of gait as well. And I really see you collapsing down on that left side. It's like the left strike is heavier so we've got this kind of mm. lifting dropping thing going on uh, which will create some imbalances for yourself and that's what she sort of wants to tell you so there's kind of two parts to this from her is one that yes she likes running faster there is no doubt about that uh, you could never run fast enough for her so you know there's that's just whatever that's, she's mm. got to do whatever she's doing on a lead. If she's out in a paddock somewhere, she can have free reign. But, and she's okay with that because, as you know, she absolutely adores you to bits. <laughs> uh, she, she can't get enough of you. Like she's like, oh, where's mum, where's mum, where's mum, where's mum? And <gasps> I don't oh. think she struggles with anxiety at the moment. But if this kind of adoration society thing gets out of control she may struggle with a little bit of separation anxiety i actually just recently had a guy come out that's a bit of a dog whisperer to just tame the, the barking a little bit because she'd done a couple of things like um the, the barking was getting a little excessive she was barking at noises and being a good guard dog but it was getting a bit excessive but i know and i know you will not think i'm weird to say this but i know she understands me so when in, in the mornings when i have to go to work i'm like i tell her i'm like hi baby up you get give you a scratch behind your ear i'm gonna go to work i'm gonna be home later we're gonna go to the park um i'll take you for a big run i love you i'll see you later and i literally say that to her every morning that i go to work and then i come home and she's so excited she runs around and then she knows she gets straight in the car if I'm taking her to the beach or somewhere or she gets the lead on and we walk to the park and yeah she totally knows what's happening she's got her routine yeah. um that routine fits in with me and she knows that I'm not here sometimes so I feel like she gets it and I feel like it, as long as I tell her and as you know I've used your services before when she was sick and I was away overseas and I needed to know that she was okay um yeah, I didn't tell her that I was leaving. So she was so worried about where I was. I hadn't come home and, you know, I'd said to her, I'll be back, you know, like I normally do, but she didn't know I was going for a long time. So she got, yeah, a bit scared. So now I just make sure I tell her every time yeah. I'm going somewhere, even if it's just up to the shop, I say, I say what I'm doing. I say, I'm going to the shop. I'm going to be 10 minutes. I know she might not know time, but um, I'll be back soon. And I say, I'll be back soon. And she knows that that means just a little while and then I'm back so yeah I think she's pretty good now 
with that sort yeah, of separation. Yeah, that's good. Because I know that's, she loves me. Yes, and so important. <laughs> and for, you know, I, I hear this all of the time from people out there, um, you know, the barking and the anxiety, so much anxiety oh. with cats and dogs these days. But animals are telepathic. They, they read mm. the images in your mind. So you want to use the words that create the image of the behaviour that you want from your animals. So when you tell her that you're going to the shop, just let her know, I'll be back in 30 minutes. Or And if you're always late, because come on, people out there, there's people that are, would be late to their own funeral. If you're always late, <laughs> add an hour on. <laughs> because if you've got, especially if you've got an anxious animal, because if you're going to tell them you're going to be back at 12, and really that means two in your lateness, then make it three and then they can yep. manage that sort of thing. So um, that's yep. great telling her. And she's eye rolling. When you're talking about that, she is eye rolling. So I know where you are. She also says that you talk a lot. You don't need to give her so <laughs> much detail as to where you're going and how long you're going to be and what you're doing because she actually knows. I actually do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, but, but the good thing is, Donna, is that when you're telling her where you're going, that's forcing an image in your mind. So if you say I'm going to work, you've probably got an image of what your work looks like and where it is and what you're going to be doing there. So she's just kind of going, yep, okay, that's familiar. I know where that is. I know where she's going and I know that she will be back. And, you know, if you go overseas, you, you know, show the video of where you're going, airplane, where you're going. And when we talk about when you're coming back, and I know we spoke about this um, when you were away last time with that, that issue, you talk about dark nights. So if you're going away for five dark nights and you can talk to them while you're away and when you're coming back, I'll be back in five dark nights. And then when, when I get back, and I think this is what you were just saying, when I get back, we're going to go to the beach and we're going to play ball and we're going to do all of these things and, and she will see that information uh, of what you're going to mm. do together. So that's great. Mm. You're doing such a good job there. Um is she okay with the small yard? That was one of your questions too. Yeah. Is she out there during the day? Is she, does she have access she outside during the day? Yeah. <clears throat> yep, yep. And there's a little garden and there's places to sniff and go to the toilet. And it's just not what we had before. So we lived in the same house where she was brought home to for the first kind of two years of her life. And I moved over here, you know, a year and a half ago. So it was a, a backyard with grass and a garage she could access and down the side of the house she could access. And this house is um, a, a balcony where I'm sitting now upstairs and downstairs has a courtyard um, with no grass. It's just paved. Um, there's a garden and she can have a sniff around in there. But we do go to the park, you know, twice a, twice a day. We go in the morning and then we go to the park in the afternoon or we do the beach. What I'm getting there is that in an ideal world she would have acres um, mm. And because she is a working dog, she does like to move. But she, you know, there's got there's a bit of a compromise here, isn't there? Because she has a great mm. she has a great mum, and you don't. She's not a lap dog. Working dogs are not lap dogs. So you don't come home and sit mm. on the couch and you know, here, Cleo, come and sit with me while she's just got energy to burn. So mm. she's okay with her circumstances at the moment as much as she can get out and run. And even if it means mm. when you're away or super busy that you hire someone to come in and take her mm. for extra walks. So because yep. she could, she could really, she could go for hours. Yeah. So two walks a day. Uh, that was. That was something that you were asking about. Two walks a day minimum, yep. absolute minimum mm -hmm. for her. As she gets older, of course, yep. you know, things will slow down. But I want to say three or four. She could go three or four walks a day and but and extended. But, you know, we have to be pragmatic, don't we, because mm. people work. You've got work to do. You've yeah. got things to do and you just can't do that. So uh, she, two is great. More is better. So however okay. you figure that, you know, or... Is it like how long do you take her out for in the morning and night? Well, the morning when she comes running, we run about 5K. Um, so that's a pretty good run. And that's then or if we do the park, yeah, if we do the park, we're down at the park for at least half an hour, sometimes longer. And if there's other dogs there, sometimes I'm there for an hour. So this morning we were down there because I had to come home and catch up with you. We were only there for maybe 20 minutes. And I take a ball and she, I just throw the ball and back and forth. She could do that all day, I reckon. Um, so, and the afternoons are sometimes longer because I'll go down at sort of after work or if I've got an early day, I'll go down there at four and we'll stay, 
you know, throwing a ball. I Sometimes I sit down there, just sit and watch her and throw the ball. So she gets lots of interactions. I do sometimes take her out in the middle of the day too. If I come home in the middle of the day, I'll run her down the park and have a third run. So two is definite every single day. I put her in a doggy daycare for a little mm. while last year. Yeah. Hated it, went out of the car. And I just stopped going because I think I tried it for two weeks and she just hated it. I could tell she didn't like it. There's a couple of things that's just come through here. One of them, there was a white fluffy dog at that daycare. Not not a friend. That, that she hates dog. white fluffy dogs. <laughs> Maltese, Shih Tzus, can't stand them. And it's yeah. weird because my kids don't like them either. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. They, they poisoned him. Maybe mind. she's picking up um, on that. Yeah, yeah. So there was, and I was going to say Maltese, so we're on the same path. But she's, there was a white, yeah. fluffy Maltese, let's say, uh, at daycare. And that's just like, why are you leaving me here with that? I do not like that dog. Um, sorry, little white dog. I'm sure you are absolutely beautiful, like all other dogs. Uh, but not, oh. not Cleo's friend. She's not uh, a fan. Thing, she's not a fan. <laughs> no, that's funny. The other thing, uh, Donna, is I was just um, getting told here to ask you for a reason. When you take her to the beach, do you take the ball with you? Yes, pretty much every single time because, and if I don't, there is a ball holder at the beach that I go to and there's usually a, ball, a spare ball in there. But if we don't go with a ball, game over. She's like, see ya, not interested. Yeah. I want to go home I'll now. So yeah. we always do, yeah. I want to say with that, the reason behind that question was um, I'm getting shown here that be very mindful of the amount of sand that she's ingesting while she's okay. grabbing the ball on the sand because that can cause all sorts of pretty serious issues into the digestive system because okay. they're eating the sand. And that's not, I guess that's not with all dogs because I don't see that often, but I'm just getting shown with um, Cleo mm. that because mm. she, uh, what I see is her kind of running and kind of charging into the ball, that that's a mouthful of sand going in. So be really, mm -hmm. and for anyone else that is taking their dogs to the beach and throwing balls around, just be really, really conscious of that because it can be a real problem. She does do that a lot, actually, now that I think about it. She's covered in sand on her face. Just be mindful of that. And while I'm talking about it, I'm just getting shown Frisbee. So I don't know whether Frisbee is an option um, for her to, yeah. to try and kind of, you know, break her habit of having a addiction to chasing balls on the beach the last question that you had was why does she bark at um, trucks and skateboards motorized skateboards and buses and things can't stand the sound there's i'm getting taken straight to her ears there's an element of um warning you it's protection mm -hmm. but it's like a little mum be careful don't walk in front of a bus mm -hmm. Or you know mm -hmm. the skateboard or whatever it is. So there's a, an element of her mm -hmm. trying to tell you something, but also I'm just getting feeling into her ears, and it's just it's a bit like fingernails on a blackboard. So the sound is ah. not really good for her. As we were talking about before, because this comes up very very often, barking dogs. When we are telling a dog not to bark, because we're we're born saying negative things like don't stop, no can't all of that sort of stuff so we want to take that out of our language when we talk to animals what we want to say is be quiet because when we say stop barking don't bark we're showing an image in our mind we're creating an image of a barking dog the no and the don't and stop you know that that doesn't matter so much to the dog it's more about what it's creating in our own video screen mm -hmm. and then the dog mm. clear reads out and goes well mum's just okayed me for barking so i'll keep doing that what you want to do is change the language so you want to create words doesn't matter what they are what can i say that will just have a dog with its mouth shut in my mind you know it's not quite as simple as all of that you've got to practice you've got to be committed to it everyone in the house needs to be on the same page but be quiet is something i use or shush uh, works really mm -hmm. well for, for our dog, especially when he starts howling at ambulances. And I know that for him, he's a border Kelpie and I know he has issues with the sound with that. So he's kind of yeah. trying to manage that. But when he when he goes off on his little barking tangents, be quiet will kind of snap him out of it. Um, yeah, okay. He's able to see. So just keep that in mind with Cleo. If you're trying to get her to stop barking, yep. be quiet. 
find a word yep. that works or a little sentence or whatever mm -hmm. and just go with that. A really good tip. I hadn't thought about it quite like that before, but, yeah, the imagery is so important because otherwise, you know, they just see what you're saying and if you're saying don't bark and the bark is the word they say, they're like, yeah, doing it. It's great. I'm allowed. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> Um, no, that's great. I'll try that. Yeah, she's actually calmed down a lot with that just when I had the dog trainer out here. He was saying, yeah, he actually did something really cool, which I thought was very clever, was put a, a little boom box out here on the balcony, actually, and he played from YouTube some motorbike sounds. And then we watched her with her ears like light up and go to bark. And then he called her in and he he gave her the treat when she was quiet and then when she went to do it again, he called her back and, yeah, we just keep doing that. But it doesn't always work. I mean, sometimes she's barking and I think, what's going on? You know, and But I think the language is really good because that's what I say to her. I say, don't bark, stop barking, stop barking. Mm. So, mm. yeah, yeah. she's probably just saying the word bark and going, yeah, cool. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we all do it. That's that's kind of how we're, we're, we grow up that way. So it's just a case mm. of of changing it over a little bit and dog trainers are fantastic you know it's like it's an add-on the the language is just yeah. an add-on to what they can show and offer you and and sometimes sometimes we just get to a point where, where we just have to manage what we've got in an yeah. animal because they're like humans you know if they yeah. don't want to do something yeah. they won't do it they have their own unique personalities so um yeah work with your dog trainer change your language and do all of those things and i, I know you're doing the absolute um, best you can for her she's really lucky to have you as a mum and mm -hmm. I'm so mm -hmm. thankful to have you and Cleo she's disappeared she's just like yeah that's a bit boring now I'm off um, but thank <laughs> you so much for joining me tonight <laughs> oh you're so um, welcome it's great to see you and talk to you as well and um, um, yeah, yeah. You've, you've been so great to help with um, lots of little things with her you know she's she's a really smart dog and a bit too smart for her own good sometimes and and despite that, though, I sometimes I don't understand what's going on with her. So it's been really very helpful having you as um, someone that can help me understand, you know, giving her a really good life. And, and um, she's a great dog. I just love her as well. That's a, a mutual feeling. And, and this is the thing with animal communication is that it can really help you when you don't know what what your animal is needing or what they're thinking or how they feel about something, that you can actually... Uh, talk to someone that can be the conduit between you and, and your animal and to help get that information. So then you know you know what you're dealing with and you know what to do next and, yeah, and go from helpful. there. Yeah, so thank you very much, Donna. Thank you, Cleo. Goodbye, Cleo, wherever Thanks, you are. Ron. Make your day richer with The Richard Wilmore Show. Meet amazing musicians, talented actors, brilliant authors, hilarious comedians, and the most creative people in entertainment. Download the KP Media TV app to watch on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire. That's the show for tonight, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here tonight joining me. Now, don't forget, subscribe to that YouTube channel because I've got some fantastic guests coming up and you do not want to miss a single one of them. Thanks for watching, everyone. Sharing Animal Matters because animals absolutely matter.